Yesterday was a record-breaking day in the United Kingdom and in parts of Europe also. Let's take a look at the high temperatures for yesterday, widespread 100-degree readings across England. And we can kind of outline that area of 100s right through here, all the way up into the Newcastle area, back through Birmingham, Manchester, and down towards Swindon. So right around London, 100 to 104 degrees. And the extreme highest temperature was 105. I don't believe I have it on this map, but it was buried in that area right there. And that's going to be Coningsby in eastern England with 40.3. Also some heat in France, 102 to 104 in the Paris area. One of the stations there reported 105, but that did not break a record. The record for Paris is 109, and that was set three years ago. Back home in the U.S., we were dealing with some blistering heat of our own. Widespread area of 110 plus through southwestern Oklahoma, the Texas Panhandle, and down into northwest Texas, almost into the DFW area, 109 reported at DFW Airport. And just to the north, Denton County, they did reach 110. Now, those did not break any all-time records, but it was pretty close. And by the way, this functionality, this is going to be in Digital Atmosphere Professional. There's going to be a new update probably in the next couple weeks, and that will be made available. And shifting gears to today, 3 p.m. data just came in. We are clear of the 110 degree readings in northern Oklahoma, but down to the south, 110 appearing once again at Lawton and Wichita Falls. And down to the south, mineral wells once again reaching 110, 110 at Breckenridge. So maybe not as brutal as yesterday, but we're definitely looking at some high readings for today. Let us check out the big picture for today. Kind of a stagnant, boring weather pattern. A reinforcement of cold air coming into the Midwest. Temperatures down into the 80s across Iowa and Minnesota. But out east, ahead of the cold front, southerly winds, very warm air, and high dew points. 91 over 78 in Indianapolis. That's going to be some very sultry air. Similar story down around Memphis. 94 over 77 at Paducah and some of that warm air making its way up into New York and New England. Down in Texas, you can see those 100-degree readings, the 110s, not showing up in the data since we're kind of zoomed out. But further out to the west, you can see an incursion of drier air. This is downslope air from the New Mexico region. Dew points in the 40s and 50s, but as we go west into Arizona... 58 degree dew points at Tucson and Phoenix. So that's close to monsoon levels of moisture, but the activity still confined to the higher elevations at this hour. And there it is, the visible imagery with the GLM lightning strike activity, confined to the Mogollon Rim, the mountains east of Alamogordo, and out around Santa Fe and Las Vegas. So that's going to be mostly the terrain above eight to 9,000 feet. Looks pretty clear out in the valleys of Tucson and Phoenix. Can't rule out something later tonight. I haven't really looked at the data too much in that region. A quick look at the high-resolution rapid refresh. Yep, does show it mostly confined to the mountains, but a little... MCS cluster may be moving into Tucson after dark, so that'll be something we'll have to keep an eye on. Hot conditions in the Great Basin area, 90s through Nevada, Idaho, and Oregon. And most of the cold air is locked up there in western Canada. Canada has lucked out this summer, plenty of cool air and plenty of precip. Let's take a look up in Alaska. It's cooled down a little bit, looking at 59 at the hour at Fairbanks, 56 at Anchorage. Not really much sign of warm air in that region. Most of that is found out in the Northwest Territories. Eastern Canada still generating plenty of cold air. 
You can see this bullseye pattern in the 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness. That's due to a cold air mass over Baffin Island producing little reinforcements of cold air that work to the south, get caught up on the backside of these weather systems, and cool things down across much of Canada and the northeastern U.S. Big Rig Steve, he's on the road from Idaho to Utah. So there he is crossing the border, heading towards Salt Lake City. And some of you probably wonder why we follow him. He's got some great views of the sky. It is live data. Always interesting to look at different parts of the country. So he's kind of in this area right here. A little bit of high-based cumulus and maybe a few showers. But overall, a fair sky. Huh, looks like a little bit of wildfire damage along the side of the road. But you can see the skies are pretty much clear, high-based cumulus, and a little bit of mid-level out cumulus. That's going to be right in there. Well, I was hoping to do a little bit of educational content today, but the hot weather is very much on our minds in Europe, here in the U.S. as well. And there's what we're looking at for the forecast temperatures this afternoon. 108 at Abilene, 105 at Tyler, 107 at Camp Mabry in Austin, and 103 at Houston. And not to be excluded, 104 at Springfield. All of that, all these numbers you see in red, those are going to break the records for the date. Uh, more of the same for tomorrow. 104 at Austin. Looks like we're backing off from that severe heat, but some of it moving up towards Memphis and Springfield, up in the Ozarks. 100 degree readings and wind slow. 103 coming close to a record. For Friday, it is looking a little bit better here in Texas, but parts of the eastern U.S. looking a little bit warm. Same thing in the Rockies. 106 at Kingman, 108 at Tucson. Going into the weekend, Saturday temperatures, once again, pretty warm out in the eastern U.S. Looks like a little bit less of that heat in the Rockies. For Sunday, we see that heat sliding into the eastern U.S., starting to show up there from D.C., Charlotte, all the way up to New York and into Connecticut. Then starting into a new week, oh, here we go again. Some of that heat showing up there in Arkansas and Oklahoma. And more of the same for Tuesday. Now these are official forecast temperatures from the Weather Service. This is not model data. Oh yeah, I forgot to show you also the northwestern U.S. Look at that, some heat starting to show up. 98 at Olympia and 101 at Eugene. Now, this functionality that you see here, this is going to be in digital atmosphere as well. I don't usually show this, but there it is. There's the menu, and you're going to find that under data, WPC temperature records, and there it is. That'll plot the readings. So if you're a digital atmosphere professional user, you should probably have that available in a couple of weeks. Well, I'm not really too sure what to show now, but I will go back to yesterday's data. This is 4 p.m. yesterday, and you can see the widespread 110 degree readings across southwestern Oklahoma, northwest Texas, and 116. What is that? Knox City? Crowell? Yeah, that's going to be Crowell, Texas, right in here, pretty close to Vernon. And right there on the other side of the Red River, 114 at Frederick. Of course, the next rad radar site is there. I'm sure the air conditioning for that equipment was probably going full speed. Let's take a look at the upper air chart. There's a lot of information to be had. We're going to see a couple key features. One is the broad Hudson Bay vortex. Also, lots of ridging across the southern U.S. The subtropical high is going to be pretty well established bouncing back and forth along this axis, and a series of waves moving onshore in the Pacific Northwest and tracking across southern Canada and the Great Lakes, not really doing much for the southern states. If we go forward, very well-defined upper-level high across the Four Corners area. That's a major reason that the precip is not very extensive in that part of the continent. 
You've got warm conditions in the mid-levels. That helps to reduce the instability and reduces the aerial extent of precip. If we go forward into the weekend and into next week, we can see that upper level high shifting back into Oklahoma and Texas, and then by the 24th and 25th, moving into the Mississippi River Basin, and then around, let's see, the 28th, we find it across the Carolinas. That may open the flow a little bit in Texas, maybe a little bit of tropical air working its way in. That'll definitely break the pattern to some extent. Another wave diving through the Midwest region, crossing the Great Lakes once again. Very well-established storm track. And the Hudson Bay vortex, there it is, helping to give us that strong westerly component across Canada and helping to drive these waves into the northeastern U.S. So cool and rainy in that part of the country as usual, ridging and hot weather in the southwest as usual. And it kind of feels like we're kind of locked into this pattern every summer. So the next big change, I, I'm looking at the Gulf, maybe something coming out of, I don't know, the Caribbean, the Gulf, coming into Texas, coming into the southern U.S., that is pretty much what we're looking at to break the pattern up a little bit. But that's probably weeks down the road. Certainly nothing on the horizon right now. The five-day outlook, yep, that's pretty quiet. There may be a little bit of hope looking at the Matt and Julian oscillation. You can see this area of suggested higher-than-normal precip working its way towards the east entering the Caribbean region around the first and second week of August. So that could be correlated with a little bit of an increase in tropical cyclone activity. And that could persist very well through the remainder of August. And coming back to the short term, some thunderstorm activity in the southeastern U.S., that'll probably shut down in about a week as that ridge starts building eastward. Active, of course, in the Great Lakes region, very wound up occlusion out there in Lake Superior. The main frontal system, that's going to be out here, warm front, and then a cold front extending south. Occlusion probably coming back out to the northwest, as shown. Fair skies in the northwest, as you saw with Big Rig Steve's clip. And still watching that meager monsoon activity in Arizona and New Mexico, but a little bit of residual monsoon moisture as well in the central Rockies. And that's about all I have for this edition of Forecast Lab. I do want to thank our newest Patreon supporter, Johan. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for the support. We'll see everybody back here on Friday for the next installment of Forecast Lab. Hope you have a great Wednesday evening. Stay cool, and we'll see you in a couple days. Bye-bye.